last week when Jesus has begun this new style of teaching using the parables. This one is a very familiar one for all of us. Something that we all have to deal with in our lives. Please. We're going to read from Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and 36 through 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? The enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you will uproot the wheat that grows with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came with him and, and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned into the fire, so it will be at the end of age. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will weed out the kingdom of everything that causes sin. And all who do evil. They will throw them into a fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who has ears, let them hear. These are the words of God for the people of God. Okay, Thanks be to God. Title this message The Weeds from the Way. And sometimes that's hard as I talk to. Thinking about this morning, it's hard to tell. The weeds from the word or the way, or in this story, the, the weeds from the wheat. This is the parable of the wheat and tares. Some call it the parable of the weeds. And last week we talked about the parable of the souls. And, and just a quick recap, we were talking about Jesus was talking about the condition of the heart. Saying that in a way that our hearts must be right to receive God's word. And this week, Jesus is talking about something that we all know about. It's about weeds. Not only are there different souls that the seed can fall in, but those seeds will face opposition. Even when we plant seed in good soil, inevitably there will be weeds or opposition. Most agree. But Jesus is talking about the constant battle that we deal with every day. It goes on in the world right now between good and evil. The weeds have been intentionally planted. They're not for good. They were meant to destroy that crop, which could cripple that family financially. So there is evil work at work in this parable. And there's evil at work in the world today. We turn on the evening news. Crime and violence. It's hard to hear some good news sometimes. I listened to a song on the way over here when I started thinking about this. Uh, Ann Murray had it out. It's, uh, sure could use a little good news today. Talk about how she wanted to just open up the paper one day and say not much to print today. Couldn't find anything bad to say. Wouldn't it be nice? In Ephesians 6, 12, it says this. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authority, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In 1 Peter 5 and 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, 
crowds around like a lion looking for someone to devour. The devil is real. And nowhere does it say that he is our friend. He's not. But he would have you think that he's your friend. We got into a good discussion in Bible study that kind of along this line it's about good and evil and sin and temptation. I thought about people's idea of the devil sometimes is that little cartoon character in a bunny cartoon or something. And he's got that little pitchfork and, and the horns. And that's, not, that's not who he is. He's real. And he's not some cuddly little cartoon character. He's real. And he works on our weaknesses. He exploits our weaknesses. If your weakness is envy, he will tell you what others have that you think that you deserve. If your trouble is with forgiveness, he will remind you of the hurt that that person caused time and time again. The devil will replay those failures in your life over and over again in your mind like a bad movie. And he likes to remind you, he likes to remind me at times that we're not worthy to be called a child of God. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The devil is a lie. Hebrews 8.12 says this, this is God talking. For I will forgive the wickedness and remember their sins no more. In 1 Corinthians, he reminds us that Christ died for our sins. He was sent here and died for us. Psalms 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So don't let the devil convince us that there is no way. God assures us that even, even amongst the weeds, there is a way. So let's talk about those weeds. I like to process. I'm looking at these scriptures through new eyes. They're not new to me, but I'm looking at them through new eyes. It's, it's like I'm letting the Spirit just guide me and, and, and ask questions. And sometimes those questions lead to more questions and some questions that I may not have answers to. And there's the power of Google. Thank goodness for the power of Google. So I thought, why? Well, didn't the workers notice the weeds? Why didn't they just pull them up right away? I mean, a lot of people believe that the weed in question was the bearded Darnell, or some people called it the tear. Some actually called it cheek. It's neat, those nicknames that we have for weeds. There's this certain vine that used to grow up uh, my dad's tobacco plants. He called them love vines. They, they were loving on that tobacco plant. It wasn't real love. There's crabgrass. There's all kinds of different names that we have. But this weed in question today looks so much like wheat until it reaches maturity that the roots would be intertwined with the weed itself. So if you pull up the weed, you're going to pull up the weed as well. I remember years ago, my brother and I we were asked by my uncle to... Uh, weed out a quarter of his tobacco patch that had been overtaken by Johnson grass. Big tall Johnson grass that we couldn't get to because it had been so wet. And we were whacking away with that hole, probably getting more plants than weed. And my brother has an idea that he's just going to see how many he can pull up at one time. How many of those big pieces of Johnson grass. So he takes and pulls with all his might and falls backwards with all of that Johnson grass and that great big old barley plant right there in all the it. So sometimes we can do more harm than good going after those weeds. And a weed that looks so much like what we're about to harvest, well, the devil's like that. He's good at pretending to be something that he's not. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14, it says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He's good at using others to appear to be good, to appear to be saying the right things, but all the time leading people away from God. 
God. There are false prophets, false miracles, false doctrines, false apostles. So sometimes it is hard to tell the weed from the way. There are new religions popping up left and right, borderline cults. People are being pulled in by this. They hear the things that the people are saying. And they believe. But I can tell you this, if those things that they're saying, if they're not saying that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, if they're not saying that he's born of a virgin Mary, if they're not saying that he suffered and died and was broken and hung on a cross in their place, if he's not saying that, if those people aren't saying that, they're not telling the truth. If they're not telling those people there that are with them that he arose from the dead to give them salvation that they didn't deserve, <coughs> that we could never earn, but we receive through God's grace and mercy. If they're not telling them that, then that's a weed. That's a lie. That's all the truth we need. And we know that there have always been weeds. From the very beginning, there was temptation right there in the Garden of Eden. And the devil doesn't just choose to tempt ordinary people like me and you. If you remember back in Matthew, the devil went after Jesus himself. But Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. Right away, Jesus knows where they're going. It says Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. It wasn't just enough that he was going to be tempted. But it says that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights before the devil came back. I can tell you, if I skip breakfast, I get a little angry. So 40 days and 40 nights, and he was about to be hit with everything that the devil could throw at him. And after the tempter came at him in this weakened state, I think the devil saw an opportunity here. He saw God in the flesh. And we know that the flesh is weak. And now he's hungry. So what's the devil do? You know those stones over there? Those stones that kind of look like bread. Not just any bread, but bread right out of the oven. I bet if you wanted to, you could turn those stones into Loads of bread. Oh, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. You're hungry. Jesus knew what he was doing. They went up to a high place and the devil continued to tempt him. I bet if you jumped off there, the angels of God would catch you and bring you right back up here. The devil actually quotes God's word. The devil quotes from the book of Psalm, I think it's 91, 11, when he tells him that he will be saved, that he's the son of God, that the angels... So if, and Jesus tells him, you know, I don't have to prove anything to you. I don't know who I am. I don't have to prove that to you. And the devil goes on to tempt him even more until Jesus has had enough and just says, get away. He doesn't ask him, he tells him to get away from me, Satan. Jesus was led there by the Holy Spirit. He resisted that temptation from the devil with the power of the Holy Spirit. We have that same power. God gives us that same power to lead and guide us and we have it with us every day. Every temptation, every time the devil comes at us, we have the Holy Spirit guiding us if we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. And I had to do that myself this week for the better part of this week, I, I was thinking about two words kept coming into my mind. Since Tuesday night, I just kept these two words. Feel good. Over and over. Feel good. And it wasn't the James Brown song stuck in my head. Well, actually, now, now the James Brown song is stuck in my head because I'm, I'm thinking about it. But, but I feel good. 
to think about feeling good. I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand where God was leading me with this. So I prayed about it. And I began to think about the message. And I began to think of a promise that was made in this parable today. When you think about God, one thing we can count on among the many, God keeps his promises. God's promises cannot be taken back. But some of his promises are dependent upon our obedience. I got curious about how many times God might have made promises in the Bible. They're it's all over the place. But one number that, that I saw more than any was 5,467. Some people think as many as 8,000 promises. Some of them rely upon our obedience to God to be fulfilled. God is trustworthy. He is unchanging. And he has the power to fulfill all of those promises. And we know that God is faithful. So let's look at the promise in today's parable. If you notice what the workers wanted to do, what their first reaction was, should we pull up? The weeds almost seems like a, a knee-jerk reaction, as if they're playing catch-up with that evil one that planted those weeds in the field. But I tell you today that God doesn't play catch-up with the devil. God knows the end from the beginning. So you notice the response of the owner. He doesn't panic. Maybe you've been through this before. So the owner said, let's just, let, just wait. There will be a time of harvest when we will separate the weed from the wheat, the weed from the word of God. So what Jesus is saying in this parable is that there will be a time of separation. That's a promise that God made. Jesus will come again. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. In Acts 1, it says the angels tell the disciples that Jesus would return in the same way that they saw him lifted up right before their eyes. And Jesus himself says, in my Father's house there are many rooms. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And I will come back for you and take you to where I am. 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So we have that promise from God. Not panic. There will be a harvest. And I thought, you know, that promise of a harvest, the, the wheat wasn't destroyed by drought or bad weather. If that had happened, there would have been no harvest. The weeds didn't destroy the wheat. Evil didn't win. May have thinned out or reduced the yield, but there will be a harvest. That's a promise. But it seems like sometimes in the world today that the weeds are winning. Maybe small battles. But sometimes God gives us those feel-good stories that are real, of people that are real, of people that are making a difference, people that are doing good things. I came across this story yesterday of a young lady named Hannah from Colorado. Three years ago, Hannah, they discovered a uh, tumor in her brain. At that time, it was the size of a golf ball. By the time they went in to operate, it was the size of a tennis ball. She was young. And by removing it, the surgery went well. And I remember seeing these, these uh, photos or these selfies that her mom and dad, before they, they were prepping her for surgery, before they went in, and they were smiling and and her mom said, you know, those smiles were on the outside. We were torn up inside. But I remember reading some of the words that she wrote, what her thoughts were. And she wrote them on paper. As they turned their daughter over to him, that's a capital H. She's talking about God. Praying that his plan, God's plan, would match her plan. And that he would give her back to them. And the surgery went well. There was 
some brain damage. And, and there was question as to whether or not her brain would heal well enough for even for her to walk again well. And I saw a picture of her as she left the hospital with a walker, making her way to her house. Fast forward to today. Hannah enjoys white water rafting. Hannah enjoys rock climbing. Hannah enjoys rappelling in the mountains. She overcame blindness due to cataracts. Can't do that. This past weekend, she rode with a partner on these uh, two person bikes in this race for cancer, a bike race. And on her legs, she wrote the names of people that had died or were still fighting cancer. And right there on her right leg, on her knee, that she would see during the course of this race, when she wanted to quit pedaling that bike, when she wanted to give up, right there on her knee was a, the name of a young lady from White House, Tennessee, named Mary Keith, that lost her battle with cancer this past year. But she saw that name, and she honored those people. That's good. Can I tell you today that with people like Hannah, the weeds don't have a chance. They don't have a chance today. We may be facing sickness or disease. Maybe our weed is financial or grief or sorrow. Things that are hard for us to overcome in our life. Many people call those crisis situations that we have in our life. Or a crisis moment. And I thought about that. And I felt something coming here. And I didn't know where it was going. But I wrote it down. I was at work. And I had to write it down quick. I wrote it on the back of a Kroger receipt. Keep one with me all the time. Never know when that spirit's going to say something to you. And God was speaking to me. And he said, don't look at it as a crisis. Don't think of those as crisis. In those times, remind yourself that that is a Christ is situation. That's a Christ is moment. Christ is my Redeemer. Christ is my Lord and Savior. Christ is my way, my truth, and my life. Christ is the sacrificial lamb. Christ is the one who conquered death and will one day come back to separate the way from the weed. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.